All right, hi everyone. Uh, welcome to reiterate the last session of the KubeCon. I hope you enjoy this KubeCon. Uh, today is the six scheduling maintainer track. Uh, my name is Wei Huang. I'm the co-chair of Six Scheduling. I work for Apple in the, as a software engineer in the AML department. Uh, my name is Ken. I'm from Docloud. I also work on Kubernetes stuff and I'm also uh, on the upstream. I work, to work together with uh, Wei. And uh, yeah, that's all. Okay, let's dive into today's session. Today's session, we are first of all, go through what scheduler is and uh, what the current framework looks like, and then give you some recent update, which is Metroid was completed in 1.29 and uh, in the upcoming 1.30 releases, and also mention some other notable updates. And then Kante will mention some sub-projects update, which is sponsored by SIG Scheduling. Okay, so first part is scheduling overview. Uh, you may have known that scheduler since 119 uh, firstly uh, introduced the scheduling framework to orchestrate the whole scheduling workflow. So basically, all the plugins right now shipped with the default Kubernetes offering are using this framework, and a lot of out of tree plugins, which is uh, a developer to satisfy in house scheduling framework. Uh, requirement are use, also using this framework. So basically, I intentionally skipped the first part, the blue, the purple part, I will mention later in detail. And then you can see we start with a sorting interface, which is internally we maintain a scheduling queue to accommodate the incoming paths. And we, the by default is sorting by the uh, path priority. And then the schedulers, the green part will choose the head of the queue and pick up for scheduling, enter the scheduling cycle. So it will go through a series of extension points. Uh, the first two is called pre-filter and the filter, which is majorly to decide whether the part can be scheduled according to predefined hard requirement or not. So by the end of this phase, it will give you a result that says, okay, how many nodes can fit this part? If yes, then continue to the happy pass is to go continue to pre-score, score, etc., which is basically to prioritize this node's candidate to give a final optimal node for the part to be scheduled on. And then once the last phase of the green box finish, uh, the scheduler will start from the head of scheduling queue again to pick up the next part to schedule the next part. So why it separate the scheduling cycle and binding cycle is because binding cycle is sometimes can time cons consuming because it has to interact with the API server to send in a binding request. So the yellow part, which is called the binding cycle, which it does what does what it does is to do uh, sending a binding request to the API server, which is basically underneath to set the spec dot no name for the for the path. So this is for the happy pass. That means you have at least one node to ac accommodate the incoming path. But it can happens that there's no single node can host the path. So it go to the, the upper layer is if you look at the uh, red sign here, so it calls post filter. That means no single node can accommodate the path. So it will trigger enter the post filter extension point. So right now, a default implementation of post filter is called preemption. So basically, it does is to evaluate whether there's any uh, like less important low priority paths can be preempted so that make room for the incoming path to be hosted on. So that is preemption. And uh, because Kubernetes, each Kubernetes part has a default grace termination period, which is defaulted to 30 seconds. So basically, schedule cannot just sit there for 30 seconds for the part to be physically deleted and then place the part on. So basically, if the part has to preempt other parts, it should be immediately returned at the end of post filter. So basically, the output of post filter is to uh, post a temporary nominated no name to the part and then return immediately. Wait for its next turn to be rescheduled 
by that time, it also will check whether the uh, victim path has been really physically deleted. So this kind of feature uh, to prefer, for example, in the next round, they will prefer using the nominating node name set on the status field for the path. Uh, it is, this feature is a little surprisingly also used by some external component like Capander, they are using this to do the scheduling in a very fast pass because they involve some uh, uh, involve some node provisioning, so it, they don't need to go through the regular scheduling flow to go through the previous, for example, 5,000 or 2,000 nodes because this post has been proved to not fit for the path. So that's basically an optimization and how it's used by other components. So recent update section, uh, we will mention a few CAPs. CAP, if you're not familiar, is short for Kubernetes Enhancement Proposal, which is a very formal process to uh, submit the features and, and uh, to track the implementation progress. So the first, one, the first one I want to introduce is called the Pod Scheduling Readiness. So as I mentioned earlier, for Sorry, for a pretty long time, this is the scheduling framework, which is just basically a part gets created, they will immediately go into scheduling queue and wait for its turn to be picked up and scheduled. But it doesn't fit for some user scenario that is once the part gets created, it doesn't really mean the part is ready for scheduling. For example, the part maybe needs to go several uh, external components to check its validness, for example, whether it is quota, some in-house quota has been satisfied, et cetera, et cetera. So that is why we introduced an extension point called pre in queue, which, has, which happens before the sorting and also, also the whole scheduling lifecycle. So once the part gets introduced, you can implement the pre in queue extension point to add customized logic to to pre-check the part. Once it's satisfied, it will uh, push it to the red, to the scheduling queue. So this feature is alpha in 126 and beta in 27 and the GA in the upcoming 130 release. So this is maybe a little uh, abstract to end user. So for the users that use this feature, we introduce the scheduling gates field in the path. So in the left re rectangle box, you can see that uh, it has two scheduling gates field. One, one is called full, one is called bar. Uh, these two this fields in the scheduling gates has to be specified at the beginning of your create the path. It can be your controller take, take the ownership of the path creation or it can be some uh, mutation web hook. But once you set it and uh, raise the part, create the part via API server is a one-way direction. So you can now say, okay, in, in sometime later, you add additional scheduling gates, and that's not allowed. So if there's some scheduling gates out there, in the bottom, you can see that this, the part will stay in schedule, scheduling gated phase. That means the part inside scheduler has not entered the regular scheduling cycle yet. You will wait there for some external signal to remove the scheduling gates. For example, the full maybe has be checked, already satisfied, then it will be remo removed, and then the bar gets removed, then it will lift up the gate to push the gate, to, to push the part to the regular scheduling uh, cycle. And then you will see uh, you normally are familiar with this, the part we are getting to from pending to running. So basically this feature introduced uh, another scheduling phase which is called the scheduling gated for you to integrate with your components to do some very customized scheduling requirements. One typical thing is that some organization has some in-house quota uh, requirement before the part can be scheduled. So this is used, I think, in the Apache Unicorns plugin mod is used a lot to increase their throughput. The next one, which is also a cap, is called the main domains in part topology spread. It's a sub-feature of part topology spread. 
the motivation is that some users, I would say a lot of users use cluster of Scala in the cloud offerings. So as time goes, the topology domains may shrink. For example, may shrink to one. Uh, and in that case, does the pop topology spread, the max excuse is actually no OP because you, you only have one domain. So in that case, all your pod will be stacked into the same domains. So that may be not the user one because they may also prioritize the, the application's resiliency, high availability over the others. So in this case, what they want maybe is that, okay, I don't want the pod to be scheduled to the same domain. That doesn't make sense to me. So what they want is that, okay, just let the pod be pending. I, I do want the pod to literally to another domain. So what you need to do is that in the scheduling uh, pod topology spread constraints field, add a mean domains equals two. To simplify, this, in this case, just mean domain equals two. So this kind of information and the depending part will be detected by your cluster autoscaler, either Capenda or Vanilla cluster autoscaler. They will create an additional domain for you, and then the part will be scheduled to the domain. That's what you want. So how to configure it? It's pretty simple. It's, the main domain is optional field, so it by default to set to one, and you have to set a, a non-negative number here. So another feature is called queuing hint. Uh, it's a very internal feature. It's not oriented for the end user, but I will mention a little bit. So in scheduler's history, before 122, how the pod can be re queued if the pod is, is pending is pretty wild, very aggressive. So basically, for every system event, no matter it's a node and a pod get deleted, will trigger move all the paths back into the scheduling queue. So you can imagine it's, it's super inf inefficient efficient because it can uh, put the high level paths again and again, push back to the head of, head of the queue. So that causes the low priority paths can, doesn't have even has a chance to be scheduled. So it's, this is classically called head of line blockings. And then in 2122, we introduced some cost grain approach by allowing the plugin developers to define which events are related, or we can say can help the failed part reschedulable. For example, in this case, you can define in your volume plugins that is only some PVC or PV event happens with the scheduler will move the part back, otherwise just stay there. But this is uh, sometimes not that fine grain. So in the latest release, we introduced the queuing hint to not only allow the plugin developers to uh, define relate, related events, instead of to de define related callback functions, which is we uh, give enough context information to the callback function signature, so you can choose how to implement that callback functions. Uh, this is the original interface, which is very simple. It's just return a series of the cluster events. A new interface looks like this. Much complex, I would say, but it can achieve better uh, throughput. It's also used in the DRA uh, implementation. But right now, uh, we found some bug, I would say. Uh, it's because of the imp internal implementation use a double link uh, list, and by sometimes the object cannot be garbage collected soon, so it causes excessive mem memory usage. So on one patch release of 128, we disable it by default. So we're still working on that to uh, optimize the internal data structure to, to make the memory usage uh, to the same level as before. So it's a queuing hint. And the next feature is called match 
label keys in part affinity or part anti-affinity. So if you are familiar with part topology spread, there's also a field called match label keys. So basically part affinity here is adopting the same philosophy. So the requirement is that as time goes, uh, upgrade the, the application is uh, definitely is a requirement. But Kubernetes, for example, the deployment upgrade is that I will spin up a new one and then I delete a new re replica and then set a new one and delete a new, uh, old, old replica. This is by default the upgrade strategy. But think about a case that you are using pod anti affinity as specified two replicas on two hosts. And then when you want to upgrade the deployment, when the new replica comes, it actually cannot find a place because the old ones are still there and the new one match the older replicas. So in this case, your upgrade is stuck because the new one can, cannot be scheduled and the old ones are still staying there. So to resolve this, we introduced the match label keys. That is, you can specify in this case a part temporary hash as a key and in runtime, scheduler will inject the concrete value for you. You don't need to be aware of that. You just need to, in your side, specify which keys can be unique, uniquely define the new replicas to differentiate it from the old replicas so it can reach, achieve what you want so that you are not stuck in the rolling upgrade. So the same case can happen to mismatch label keys. So it's the impair with the label keys. So, but basically, in the runtime, the operator will be not in comparing to the previous match keys in. Okay, the last cap I want to mention is the 10 manager decoupled from node lifecycle controller. So, basically, this is a, a cross SIG feature, which is mainly related with scheduling, mainly related to SIG apps and SIG node. But historically, uh, we choose scheduling to host this. So basically, uh, the motivation is in the old implementation of no lifecycle controller, we don't differentiate, we, don't, we just use one simple controller to do two things, to define how a part, sorry, how a node is tainted upon which conditions, and when the, when the tents are applied, how the part should be evicted. So that is sort of mixed uh, responsibilities in one single controller. So for some user cases, we want to separate them so that they can continue to use the upstream default implementation of define how the node should be tainted upon what the kind of conditions and also use another component to replace the entry implementation to do uh, what they want, like to see, okay, maybe this tent should not trigger eviction or trigger eviction another way. So this feature is for that. To basically, it's more uh, refactor the code base so that uh, give the give give the users more freedom to do their customization. So on the noted updates, one thing I want to mention is that uh, the cube. Cube scheduler configuration has been pretty stable uh, along the years. So right now, in the upcoming 130 release, we will just simple serve one uh, version, which is V1. The old ones like V1 beta 3 are all removed in 129. Okay, I will hand over to Kenten to introduce the subprojects. Thanks, Wei. So next, I'll go through the subprojects and see what progress we made in the past several months. So the first one is Cork. So before we dig into the details, I would like to know how many people sitting here has ever used Cork before. And if yes, please raise your hand. One, two, three. Not much, but yeah, good. So Cork is a tool key that helps to build a cluster. Uh, so you know, it's, you, you can take it as a can, but the difference is can still consume resources. But Cork, there are only API objects. So it will not uh, use actual resources. Let's take a uh, look at the picture. So actually the control plan will communicate to the cork directly and there is no couplet. So 
uh, you can fix the status of your a uh, API objects and uh, uh, that's, uh, actually that's why you can build up a cluster with thousands of nodes in a laptop because there are, there are only API objects, there are no uh, real resources are being used. And in the uh, past, uh, in the last release, uh, we uh, achieved several features. So the first one is about the simulation for the CPU and the memory usage. So actually, you can act as you are running the real pod in your cluster, in your core cluster. And uh, the second is about the stage API. So uh, stage API is uh, you can is a CRD. So you can define the desired state you want, and you can actually define several states you want. They can transit from one state to another, and uh, yeah, you can almost mock the whole life cycle of your API object. And uh, also, uh, Cog has a toolkit uh, named uh, Cog Control. So we add uh, three new commands, the hack, the record, and the reply. So the hack command can, you know, uh, modify the resources in etcd directly by passing the API server. Uh, this is not uh, that secure because, uh, you know, you are skipping the API validation, defaulting. So you should uh, be careful when you want you want, want to use this uh, command. And uh, another one, you know, uh, basically when you uh, have a bug and it's hard to reproduce, so you can use the record command to uh, to write down all the events happened in that moment and uh, reply replay them, and you can repeat this again and again and, uh, until you find figure out the reason why uh, the loose cause. Yeah. Okay, the third one is about uh, the integration with the metric server. So uh, I, I think this is why you can, you know, like, you know, uh, you can simulate the CPU and the memory usage. So all about Coco is about uh, simulation. So for the next step, we'd like to uh, simulate like the GPU usage because GPU is expensive and also the volume provisional and uh, like the 4D pod and the node scenarios. Uh, so this page is about uh, the, uh, how Cork is widely used across the community. So we can see a lot of uh, organizations, uh, communities have used Cork already. And uh, yeah, Cork has uh, achieved, uh, you know, got more than 2,000 stars in, in, uh, today. It's quite popular, right? And the next about uh, Q. Uh, so still, I'm also a contributor of Q, so I would like to see uh, because in this KubeCon, I heard several topics mentioned about the queue. So I would, I would like to know how many people here have ever used the queue before. If yes, one, two, oh yeah. Great, great to see that. So uh, basically, queue is designed to for the job management and uh, uh, job queuing. So it offers quite a lot of capacities like the priority-based uh, job ordering and the job uh, uh, preemption. Yeah, and the queue is quite good at the resource quota management, like you can fair share your resources across different tenants and borrow resources from different tenants. This can help somehow, you, you know, improve your resource, uh, resource utilization. And the next about the fungibility is this can somehow, you know, uh, for cost saving, like you have a uh, uh, spot instances, and uh, if if there is not enough, then you can fall to the on-demand ones. Uh, the next is about uh, the multi-cluster support. Yes, Q right now is 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 support the multi-cluster, and we will talk a bit about that uh, later. And uh, in Q, we uh, we actually support a lot of uh, jobs like batch job, no doubt, and all kinds of Kubeflow jobs, the uh, read job, and the pause and the pause groups. Yeah, I think the most important thing about Q is that you can uh, work Q with the Kubernetes native components uh, smoothly. Uh, so there is no migration work there. Oh, I forgot that. So we got more than one uh, one thousand stars a uh, weeks ago. I think that's a big milestone for our, for our project. So this is uh, how Cork, uh, sorry, how Q works at a high level. So for short, the Q will have to manage how jobs are 
uh, when the job will run, when the job should be claimed, and then when the job is admitted, it will leave the scheduling to the default group schedule. And if there is not enough resource in the cluster, the cluster auto scheduler will uh, take place. Yeah. This is how Q works. And a weeks ago, we just released a new minor uh, version, uh, 0 0.6.0. Actually, we introduced a bunch of big features in this release. So the first one is about uh, the multi-cluster support, aka uh, multi-Q. So this is a master worker model. So uh, the, you have to install the Q in each cluster. And the master uh, Q will decide which cluster to dispatch the job to run. If you uh, are interested with this uh, feature, you can, you know, uh, read the cap for more details. The so next one is about the visibility API. Uh, it's somehow for the insights of the planning jobs, planning, planning, planning workloads. So you can have an overview about how your cluster looks like, how many jobs are running, and how many jobs are pending right now. And next about the landing limit. So before this feature in queue, uh, let's say we have uh, two tenants, and uh, one tenant can borrow the resource, can borrow the all resource from another tenant. So it's greedy. Uh, so with this uh, lending limit feature, you can, you know, uh, guarantee some resource for self usage, and it will never be borrowed by your neighbors. And uh, another is about all or nothing queuing. So. I want to highlight that this is uh, completely different from the group scheduler poor group. It's uh, only implicit in the uh, QQ, uh, queue. So, uh, but, but the capacity is quite the same. So you can uh, uh, you can annotate the pod. Uh, so, so, so a group of pods can be uh, queued as a unit. Yes. And uh, before we uh, support the rate job, but some of our customers uh, say that I, w uh, I also have some rate cluster in, in our queue, so I would also support the rate cluster, so it came. And we also uh, support some, you know, enhancements for the preemption and some new policies. For the next step, we uh, mostly focus on three things. Uh, the first one is about the more fairness uh, resource sharing, like the uh, dominated resource fairness. And, uh, you know, uh, right now, uh, Q only support two level uh, hierarchy, hierarchy. So the cohort, the class Q, but it's not enough in a big company. So we are now considered to support the hierarchical cohorts. It's already designed and, uh, yeah. The last one is about the integration. Integrate with the k, k server so we can manage the uh, you know online online survey online influence service and the offline influence service together. Also the group flow pipeline. And the next about uh, uh, what some extension. I guess a uh, few people here has uh, heard about this project. So uh, today we have several several ways to extend our schedule. The first one is the uh, schedule framework. This is recommended. And the third one is about the multi schedulers. And the third one is about the schedule extenders. So, uh, schedule framework is, is you know, uh, uh, you know, it's recommended, but it's not, you, but you have to recompile your schedule once you have a new plugin. And the, and the uh, schedule extender is quite flexible, but it's slow because it invokes further API uh, requests. So we still lack, uh, you know, flat, uh, uh, you know, a dynamic way to uh, to recompile uh, to extend your schedule, but it's quite it's still efficient. So that's why we introduced the awesome extension. This is, uh, you know, high level picture about how awesome extension looks like. So we have uh, uh, awesome plugin in the schedule. We we usually call the host plugin, and we have several guest plugins. So the guest plugin is actually where your scheduling logic is located. So, so we have combined your, let's say you have uh, several guest plugins and uh, you implement the functions and we, we, then we are com, uh, compile them to the Watson files. And the Watson plugin, the host plugin, we are loaded the Watson files. So that, that's how it works uh, generally. 
So uh, with the Wasm extension, so you don't need to recompile the scheduler. You just need to replace the Wasm files. Or, yeah. And it's faster than the schedule extender. Also, because uh, you know, we have to implement the extension uh, points in Wasm plugin as well, but the, but the uh, interface is, is quite similar to the schedule framework. So you will have the same experience like developing the traditional schedule uh, plugins. Also, it's a, sa a safe sandbox because even if you panic in your guest plugin, the group schedule will not be impacted. But yeah, uh, it's still uh, slower than the you know, uh, uh, schedule framework right now. So if you want to use the uh, uh, some extension, how to use, how to run this. So first, first of all, you have to recompile the schedule with the host Wasm plugin because it's still out of the tree. But one day when it became the mature, we may uh, make it uh, into, I don't know. And the second, you should uh, enable the guest plugin. It's quite, it's quite similar to what we do today. So you just uh, configure your Kubernetes uh, schedule configuration. Uh, here we enable the two WASM plugins, uh, plugin one, plugin two, and we specify the guest path, and then it works. We are very close to our first release, yeah. Uh, and if you want to try in advance, so we have a sample here, so please. And the next about the schedule plugin. So we host some out of tree plugin in this repo because not all the plugins are fit for uh, every user. So uh, besides the stable ones like the code scheduling, the capacity scheduling, we introduced uh, two new plugins. So the first one is about the system core based scheduling because uh, some ports will share the you know the same the same host kernel. So the system calls may uh, lead to some uh, attack of a node. So the scheduling can make decisions based on the system core usage. Uh, so even if attack happens, there will be fewer, uh, fewer victims in your cluster. Yeah, you can take a look if you want, if you uh, have similar uh, demands. The next is about the disk IO aware scheduling. So it's quite straightforward. So you it, it can make the string, uh, scheduling decision based on the real-time disk I.O. So to achieve this, you have to uh, install a disk driver in your, age, uh, in your, in your each node, so it will report the real-time disk to the, a new CRD, and the scheduler will read the uh, information for uh, wise scheduling. Yeah, we also got more than 1,000 stars. So the next about the scheduler, so you know, a cool schedule make uh, scheduling decisions at a certain time, uh, a certain point. So, but you know, our cluster is churning, so some nodes may come in, some pods may be deleted. So this will lead to unbalanced cluster. So this is what the schedule works here. It will evict the unbalanced pods and make them uh, schedule again by the default scheduler. In the new release uh, 0.29, we didn't introduce many big features, but we do have some reinforcements like respect the node affinity policy, node tenant policy, and the mesh label keys in the uh, port to pre spread plugin. And also we respect the image pool back off in the port, lab, uh, port lifetime plugin. So yeah, we also have some uh, significant fix like the user experience improvements, docs, helm installations, logs, and yeah, so several CVEs. And each time I talk about the disk scheduler, I will find there there are some new uh, contribut uh, uh, contributors in disk schedule. And this time as well, we have got new, we got five new contributors. So you see, this is inspiring for the maintainers, right? Yeah. So uh, that's all for today's session. And but if you have uh, Question: If you have inspiring ideas, you can bring to our Slack, and you can also sub subscribe our mailing list, and also join our uh, meetings, the six scheduling, the just schedule, just just the uh, scheduler, whatever. And thanks to all the contributors. Yeah, thank you. So, yeah, you can write and leave your feedback uh, by scanning the QR code. And if you have any questions, yeah, please go ahead.
Yeah, thank you for the session. Uh, I had a question about scalability on the pre-NQ plugin, the new plugin that you showed. Ha are there any tests done on how many pods it can hold? Uh, for pre-NQ, actually, the pressure is not from scheduler. Instead, this is the opposite way. Introduce pre-NQ is to release the pressure on scheduler. Because as I mentioned, pre-NQ, the part of the life cycle will just go through one direction cycle. So it will impose extra pressure to the API server and also no extra cycle to uh, the regular scheduling cycle because that's the pre the scheduling cycle. And then the pre in queue can happen uh, very lightweight. So uh, for the default scheduler, the implementation, you can think of it's just one line code whether check the lines of the scheduling gates equals zero or not. But when it in terms of external plugins, it will quite depends on your implementation. For example, if you in your plugin implementation, you involve uh, API call to AWS or externally, that will definitely as the uh, latency to the scheduler. But for scalability, uh, it doesn't impose the pressure. It's just Depends on your implementation as well as the latency. Yeah. Can it hold thousands of pods? Yeah, you can hold. Yeah. Yeah. Because uh, I can, yeah, mention a few words. Is implement the internal implementation of pre in queue is that uh, it's only invoked by the, by the pods gets in queue. So if the pod that means that the part is only in queue once, if you want. So in the later case, it's all based on the signals that it sends to the scheduler via some other ways. For example, the scheduling gates implementation is to uh, re remove, the, remove the gates. So if your implementation is pretty graceful, I don't think hosting a thousand parts is a, is a pain. Uh, you mentioned that uh, there are some enhancements in the uh, plug uh, the framework, right? So, for example, the callback interface, if I recollect. Uh, so, the existing uh, plugins uh, doesn't require to implement uh, any enhancements to be able to cope with these uh, extensions, enhancements in the actual framework? So, scheduling framework, the actual ones are all designed in a backwards compatible way. So that means if your existing plugin doesn't want to use the latest SDK interface, they can still work as is. It's, that means the behavior is still as before. For example, for queuing hand, you will still adapt to the older ones that is uh, used associated with some cross screen events, right? But you want to opt in, you then adapt to the upgrade to the latest SDK and choose to opt in. Yeah. Okay. This is always the design rational. We we, we don't break uh, the order. Sure. Like so that also means that uh, if I think we are run out of time, right? Yeah. So I will be here to answer. Okay. Sure. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for everyone coming. I think we are the very last slot for the session. So uh, enjoy your KubeCon. Thanks. <laughs>